Screening at Monsterfest next month is a, a new Australian film called The Dunes. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the writer, producer, director, lead actor of The Dunes, Martin Copping. Martin, welcome to Movie Metropolis. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's good to be here after a few <laughs> technical issues. <laughs> <laughs> Our technology, where would we be without it stuffing up? I anyway, know. all good. <laughs> yeah. All good. Now, tell me about the inspiration behind this film, because it is uh, such an intriguing story of the past and the, and the present. Yeah, it's, uh, it's obviously it's a very personal uh, film. After I lost my mum five years ago, she had a, a drinking problem and she died from alcoholism. And um, I think as part of the process of, you know, coming to terms with that and moving through it, um, I wanted to, you know, channel the experience in a positive direction that can potentially, you know, help other people and myself. And uh, I'd wanted to make a direct a feature film for a long time. You know, as you probably know, I've been in the industry as an actor for many, many years. And uh, yeah, this, I wasn't planning on doing it this, this soon, um, but it just, it felt really organic. And, you know, I had a lot of personal things that I was processing and, and I've always loved to write and, and produce and direct. And this seemed like a really good, uh, you know, channel to, to put all of my life experiences and the emotions that I was going through. Okay. Well, well done on that. What, what were the Thank challenges you. you faced in particular writing the story, the screenplay, uh, and then uh, obviously being able to make the film? There were a lot. <laughs> um, I guess, uh, you know, with the, with the writing process, I... Uh, I'd had this idea uh, rattling around my head for a long time. I've always loved thrillers. Um, you know, the idea of a, a monster trying to make its way into, you know, everyday society and, and what people have to do to kind of deal with that. Um, and that, you know, that was kind of the basis. I've been inspired by, uh, you know, some other films, uh, Joel Edgerton's The Gift, uh, Cape Fear. It's so, you know, really high interpersonal uh very tense uh thrillers um i also wanted to shoot something that was very contained you know the old horror adage is you, you know you don't need stars because horror is the star shoot it in one location because it's cheap and controlled you're not worried about you know sound issues or lighting issues and uh and i, I have a place on the on the mornington peninsula in australia and it, you know that seems like seemed like a, a perfect location and you know I had some friends who I've been wanting to work with for a long time uh you know other actors from Melbourne and um yeah wrote the film in I, I after I decided to make it I wrote the film in 10 days uh I booked I booked my flights for 10 days from when I decided to make it went to a coffee shop every day and just you know wrote and 10 days later I had a script got on the plane and we started shooting as I entered LAX, uh, stole a lot of footage. By that, I mean, you know, shot without permits mm. and, um, and basically shot for a, a full 10 days in Australia. And uh, yeah, then spent quite a few years in post-production, uh, raising post funds and, mm. and just finishing the films. We, we had a lot, we had a lot of hurdles along the way. Um, you know, I'd, I've made some shorts before, and I, I thought I knew, oh, I, I can take care of this. I know what I'm doing. And lo and behold, a feature's a different beast. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we got over the line and I'm, I'm actually really, really happy with, you know, the final result. I saw it on a on the big screen at Naples International Film Festival. I played at the Cineplex Theatres and I was really, really happy with um, all the work that everyone's done on it. Oh, congratulations on that. That's, that's uh, terrific to hear that. Thank you. So tell me about casting because you have such an uh, an interesting cast uh, in the film as well as yourself. Tell me about that process. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I obviously, you know, I didn't cost anything, so <laughs> it it made sense that I cast myself in the in the main character as the main character. Um, and then uh, the rest of the cast was, for the most part, comprised of actors I've worked with over the years and, and friends of mine. Tim Phillips played the the man, main antagonist and uh yeah he's he's incredible we've been we've been good mates for a long time and we moved over to LA at the same time and we've shared a hell of a lot of experiences in the industry together and uh 
yeah, I, I really admire his work and he's uh, one of my dearest friends. You know, I admire him a lot as a person. So he was he was a great choice uh, to play Nighty. And then, you know, I had a, a bunch of other Aussie actors and friends that I've worked with. Um, uh, Marsha Vasilevskaya, she's an old friend of mine. Uh, Kate Nielsen, um, yeah, but basically everyone's was was good friends who I've either worked with over the years or or have been friends, and um, I, I was super happy with what everyone did, you know. And then I, I cast my dad as my dad, which was really nice. He's he's getting on now; he's got dementia, and this was kind of the last opportunity for us to work together. So uh, I cast him as my character's father, who has dementia. And uh, he was—he was good. He was good. He was—he was a cinematographer in his day. He was a big figure in the Australian film industry. So um, I feel very privileged that I, you know, got a chance to work with him on on equal footing because he—he always had me assisting on jobs when I was a kid. I recognise the name, the copying, of course, and and uh, yes, uh, absolutely. I—I I, I remember uh, cinematography from the past. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, Al- Alvin, Alvin Purple and Stork and yeah. Eliza Fraser and 2,000 Weeks, you know. He, he was involved in a lot of uh, the Ausploitation era films. So I can see how you've inherited the love of filmmaking yourself. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember as a kid, Dad would have his birthday parties and, um, you know, we'd have all these colourful uh, characters would show up, Graham Blundell and... Abigail and um, I remember as a very young kid spending time with them and you know feeling like I was at home with with performance artists so yeah it, it, the apple didn't fall too far from the tree let's just say that <laughs> fair enough so tell me about the 10-day shoot because uh, there is a, a fair bit of dialogue in the film there's some uh, intricate uh, scenes uh, as the plot develops how did you find making that or shooting that while you were also front and centre as the actor? Yeah, it was, it, I mean, it, it was a fair bit of pressure. I, you know, I've always sort of believed that you're a reflection of the, you know, the people you surround yourself with. And I got the most talented people that I, that I had access to. Um, obviously, I was on a limited budget. So, you know, people very kindly donated time for fees that were, not what I would have liked to have paid them. Um, but, uh, you know, they, like my cinematographer, uh, I've worked with him before and he knew what I wanted and it was nice to be able to lean on him a little bit. And my other, my other uh, plan was to run and gun the whole thing. So we shot pretty much the whole thing handheld on a gimbal, um, which caused us a whole bunch of problems in post. But uh, it, it meant that we could move very, very quickly. I knew I wouldn't have more than two takes for any scene. Um, which is part of the reason I cast people who I, I thought really fitted the characters are in. Um, but yeah, it was a skeleton crew, and uh, we, yeah, we just had to move very fast. I was really familiar with the uh, with the storyline, obviously, and um, it, it was also nice as a performer to just just do what I wanted to do and not have a director, you know, getting their fingers in there and really. Um, molding my performance which is not a bad thing but it, it was just really nice not to have the pressure of you know am i doing the right thing i could just play the character how i wanted to play it and i thought everyone else was fantastic but it was it was a really fast moving process as i said we had 10 days and we had a hard out uh, myself and the cinematographer were booked on a flight i was out of money you know i made the whole film on credit cards at that point and um i, I had to get it all and uh yeah we we just made it, just made it, but we, you know, we, we got it all there. So um, I did have to do some reshoots and some pickup shots, but uh, yeah, we, we got it along. <laughs> well, well done on that, for persevering and getting that film uh, completed. That's great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I was also intrigued too with the music score, um, Antonio Tranquilino. It's a, it's a really nice music score that fits into the film quite nicely. Yeah, um, I originally I had a, a temp track that I'd put in by an Australian artist called Rye X, who uh, I used to know in, in LA years ago. And he's just writing some incredible uh, some incredible music now. So I temped it to that. 
And then Trank, he's a friend of uh, my editor, Freddie Rod Rodriguez, and he's just, he's on a whole nother level. He's since then, he's, you know, we've worked together on a bunch of different projects. He actually scored a video game that I just built. Um, but yeah, he's amazing. And I think he understands me. He understand, uh, understood the film. And um, I think he really, you know, he took the elements that I liked from, uh, from Rise Music and then, you know, created something completely different but that had that same soulful feel. I wanted to have a very ethereal um, sensibility to it uh, and a dreamlike quality. And, I, yeah, I think he just did an amazing job. Um, I actually want to go go back in before I release it publicly and and just boost the music a little bit because when I saw it on the Cineplex, I still felt the levels were a little bit low. Um, and I think it's really important that, that the film has that dreamlike quality because it's such an important, you know, aspect of it. But, yeah, he's incredible, incredible. Again, well done on that. That's great. So, as you said, the film screened uh, uh, in Naples and, of course, it'll be at Monster Fest next month. Uh, will it be yeah. rolled out further after that? Yeah, well, I'm uh, talking with some sales agents at the moment. Um, I'm just deciding which direction I want to go in terms of uh, releasing it. But yeah, I think we'll be rolling it out early next year. Um, it's been getting a great response on the festival circuit. It's, it's already won, I don't know, over 20 awards. Um, and it's, you know, it's getting a very positive response. It, it is an art house film. So I, I think I do need to be selective with how I uh, run out the release. But yeah. Um, yeah, we'll just we'll just have to sort of play it by year. You know, I'm happy to keep running festivals for another couple of months, and um, you know, it helps to build the press kit. And it's appetising for for sales agents and distributors. I think if the if the film's got a little bit of heat behind it, so I've been having a lot of fun running the festival circuit and travelling around, seeing it on the big screen. <laughs> oh, that's terrific because it is quite an effective yeah. psychological thriller, and it's a uh... Uh, it, it works very well. So I can see how it uh, it has a niche, which, uh, uh, as you say, art house, which would appeal to a lot of people. Yeah, I do. I think you're right. I think it is a niche film. And um, I think it's important with any project that you're working on to, to be realistic about, you know, where it should live. Um, and film festivals have been a really good way of sort of, you know, showing me who the audience is, the people that are responding to it, how they're responding to it um which also helps with marketing you know so i know what to put in the press kit um yeah yeah it's it's a, it's a really exciting process because i've you know i've made i've made a lot of shorts before and I've, I've been a producer on a lot of features but this is the first big one where i've had to sort of follow through onto the other side of distribution and marketing and you know it's a whole nother beast to the creative side that i'm sort of comfortable with and uh yeah i'm enjoying the challenge but it, it's a challenge I can imagine. Yes, I understand. It's a, it is a challenge, and and I suppose that gives you the impetus, perhaps, to write some more films. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've got a few that I've been um, working on for the past couple of years, a few different concepts, but uh, one in particular, I think I've, I think I've found the next one that I'm gonna. Oh. Battery was dying on the phone. Um, I have to plug that in. Uh, yeah, I've got one in particular that I think is going to be the next one that I that I get up. I'm really excited about it. And I've got some other some other acting projects in the works, but I'm sort of yeah most excited about this next film. Um, I can't wait to sit down and I've got the the synopsis nutted out, but I want to start scripting it. So I think the next couple of months that's all going to develop. Very good. Well, as you've said, and as I, I saw in your uh, filmography, you have quite a number of credits to your name as an actor. And uh, um, uh, and so being a director as well means that you're coming from a perspective where you understand actors and how uh, yeah. how important it is to work in front of a camera as well as behind the camera. So, yeah, 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 it's, it, it, it is good, you know, sort of moulding the two things together. Um, a lot of the, the filmmakers that I really admire, they, you know, they do that. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the business model that uh, Clint Eastwood has, Sylvester Stallone, Woody Allen, um, Joel Edgerton, where, you know, you can make yourself a sort of, you know, your own little industry um, where you can, you know, support the, the creatives around you that you've come up with. And, you know, hopefully then we, we can all do that together. and. Um, 
you know, over here, you see those little niche clicks. I'm in LA at the moment. Um, you know, Seth, Seth Rogen and Jonah Hill, and they've all got their own little posses and they, they really do watch each other's backs and, um, give each other an ability to, to, you know, keep being creative together, which is, you know, it's all I want to do. Tell me about your experience in the U S in Los Angeles, acting on various roles there, et cetera. How has that been for you? Um, very, very different to Australia. Um, I find, I found it very challenging trying to get my career up in Australia. I think, you know, there is a lack of work. It's fiercely competitive. Um, I think when generally when people enter the industry, they, they, they really know what they're doing in Australia. Whereas I feel like people with a, a, a wish and a prayer will come to America and, and have a crack. Um, so I feel that, yeah, it's, I, I just found it a lot, I guess a lot more challenging in Australia. And when I moved to America, they also, the Americans have that mentality of be the best that you can be. And if they see that, you know, you're passionate, reliable, and you have a little bit of talent, they'll do what they can to help you. And they'll, they'll grab your coattails and, and go along for the ride. Whereas I never felt that in Australia personally, in my, in my experience, the tall puppy thing was pretty real for me. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's been, I think it's opened a lot more opportunities and not only that, you know, I've, I think I've matured as a person and as a performer and, um, you know, maybe, maybe had I been this way <laughs> when I was actually living in Australia, it's been, you know, 12, 13 years. Um, it might have been a different story. So I think I've probably grown up a lot too. Can't, can't blame everyone else. <laughs> but I, I, I love it. You know, it's the, all, the, all the shows that I and, and movies that I watched growing up, you know, I, I've worked with those actors now and it's, it's pretty surreal to walk on. Even now, you know, I've been out here a long time when I walk on set and I'm seeing people that I've legit idolised, you know. My first one of my first jobs was playing Steven Seagal's best friend, and that was my every Friday night was watching Steven Seagal film, action films, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, it's 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 pretty it's been a pretty special experience, and as I said, very surreal, and uh, I never get sick of it, and it, it never loses its novelty. I'm constantly pinching myself, going, "What is going on?" You know. Um, yeah, so. Keep keep doing it, and as long as I can keep working, I'm I'm pretty happy. You know, sounds good to me. That's uh, that's a really interesting experience, and uh, and juggling the US and 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 Australia and so on. Uh, look, Martin, congratulations on the Dunes uh, screening next month at the uh, Monster Fest, um, and uh, I look forward to uh, your next films, both acting and uh, directing. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. Yeah, I, I look forward to, to making another one and getting it out for, for you guys. So, yeah, it's been great talking to you. You too, Martin. All the best. Thanks so much for talking. Take care. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Bye-bye.